This is Biblical Insights with Dr. Jim Dennison of the Dennison Forum, answering today's toughest questions. My uncle is a homosexual, and he, knowing that I'm a believer, has come to me many different points uh, and asked me different questions such as, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does it say about me getting married? Things like that. Uh, I find it hard to respond to him. How do I respond to him from in a loving way, because I love him, um, while also not condoning mm-hmm. those actions. Stephen, that's really the issue. Uh, I appreciate you personalizing that. I understand that for your own family, this is very, very personal and intimate as a question. And uh, it's an issue for so many people. It's really hard to find somebody who hasn't been touched in a personal way by this issue. It's a very complex issue, as you would know. I've written uh, uh, very long chapters and books on this specific subject, and we have uh, papers on our website that get into this in much greater length than we have time for in this brief conversation. But I could at least summarize, I think, some of the issues in this way. The first point I would make is that the Bible consistently tells us that God does not intend us to live in same-sex relations. That's in the Old Testament, that's in the New Testament. That's Leviticus 18, Leviticus 22, Deuteronomy 23. But you also find that in Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1. Some that would say that's an outdated uh, dietary requirement like kosher law or something like that, that it's an Old Testament outdated legalism. That's just not true because every place the Bible speaks to it, it tells us not to engage in this behavior, New Testament as well as Old Testament. A second point some would say, uh, would argue is that the Bible doesn't understand uh, consensual, monogamous, homosexual relations. That what the Bible is forbidding is homosexual abuse or rape or incest or some such as that. Well, the Bible certainly forbids that. You have the sin of Sodom in Genesis 19, for instance, but homosexuality was known to the ancient world. It was very much known in the Greek world and in the Roman world of the New Testament. It was even known to the Canaanites in the time of Moses. And yet the Bible consistently and unambiguously tells us that this is not God's best for us, that this is not God's intention for us. So that moves to a third point. Why would the Bible forbid this kind of behavior? Especially if your uncle were to say, God made me this way, or I didn't choose this lifestyle. I don't remember a time that I wasn't attracted to men, something like that. Then is this God's fault? And why would God condemn something that he created? Is a huge issue inside all this. Well, science has not settled and may never settle the nature versus nurture question here. The degree to which uh, sexual preference is inherited or it's determined by uh, your environment, it's determined by your experiences growing up, that, that will always be a question, I think. But just because a person has a proclivity to do something doesn't make that always the right thing for them to do, you know? It's a terrible example in some ways by way of analogy, but we do know that there's a genetic predisposition toward alcoholism that some people unfortunately have to wrestle with. Well, we wouldn't come along and therefore say alcoholism is therefore appropriate for them. You know, I don't mean to compare homosexuality to alcoholism in that sense, just in the sense that the fact that a person has perhaps an innate desire to do something doesn't make that necessarily the right thing for them. Uh, The fall affected all of us. All of us are affected in in various ways and and are broken people in various ways. And for some people, that may be part of what the fall means for them. And that leads to three practical statements I'd want to make. First, we're all broken sexually. All of us are. Heterosexual sin is just as much sin as homosexual sin is. In fact, I've often said in pastor conferences that in the churches I know about anyway, I've seen far more division and controversy and problems in churches from heterosexual sin than from homosexual sin. I've never myself uh, known of a pastor or a staff member who had to face discipline relative to homosexuals. And I know there are some, I just haven't known them personally, but I've known a number who had to struggle with heterosexual issues and heterosexual sin and, and the consequences of all of that. So number one, we're all broken sexually. We're all broken people and we're all broken sexually. Number two, homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. Even though the Bible lists it among sins, it's not unpardonable. It's not that sin that keeps you from a relationship with God. The unpardonable sin is rejecting the pardon found in Christ. It's rejecting salvation. That's the only sin God can't forgive because we're rejecting forgiveness. But all other sins can be forgiven by God. They can be redeemed by God. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists homosexuality among the sins of the people to whom he's writing. And then he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were redeemed, you were transformed. So homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. And the third point I make is God loves us all. Whether we're gay or straight, whether we're dealing with this issue or some other issue in our lives. Jesus loves all of us. He died for all of us. He died for everybody's sin and for every sinner. God loves your uncle just as much as he loves me or he loves you. 
if his sin is in the area of homosexuality, or at least that's his brokenness, or, or that's his attraction, or that's what he struggles with, well, that doesn't make him unique as a broken person. He may be tempted by things you and I are not tempted by. We may be tempted by sins he's not tempted by. And all sin is sin in God's eyes. That's why he loves us all. That's why his grace is available to all of us, whatever it is that we're struggling with today. Thanks for that, Jim. What I'm hearing is that there's this tension between viewing homosexuality as a sin, some broken part of, of um, you know, a believer or a non-believer's mm-hmm. walk. There's this tension between that and the fact that God loves all of us. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I've encountered is um, this response from some people who struggle with this issue that homosexuality is almost a part of their identity. Mm-hmm. They don't view it as... Mm-hmm something that's an element of brokenness in their life, they view it as all of them. Mm -hmm. So to reject that part of it or to view it as wrong is to view Mm -hmm. them as just Mm -hmm. entirely broken. Mm -hmm. Um, How do we respond to that? How do we show, um, you know, people who wrestle with this issue that we love them, that we care about them, that God loves them especially, Mm -hmm. um, while also condoning it? How do we Mm -hmm. draw that line? It's the huge challenge. It really is between condemning and condoning. We don't want to condemn the person, but we don't, we don't want to condone that behavior which God forbids because it's harmful for them, you know? You can look at the depression rates. You can look at suicide rates. You can look at disease transmission rates. And I don't mean that to be unkind. Those are just facts. And some would say, well, that's because we're homophobic. Well, we see some of those same issues in Denmark and Sweden and places where homosexual behavior has been accepted for decades. And there still are enormous issues that are just the other side of that. And as unkind and intolerant as they may sound, those really just are the facts as regards some of the issues that are involved in homosexual lifestyle, homosexual behavior. And so the person comes along to say, well, you're separating one part of me from the rest of me as though that mm-hmm. is, is how I experience life, and that's just not true. The person might say, I am gay, not just I'm attracted to men or I'm attracted to women or whatever the issue might be. And this is all of me. And so if you're telling me that God forbids this, you're really saying God forbids me is what you're really telling me. What I'd want to say in response is that while that may be how they're experiencing life, that's not how God sees them. God doesn't see any of us as though one part of us is all of us. God knows all of our dimensions better than we do. He recognizes that our behavior or even our attractions in various parts of our lives do not constitute the entirety of us. And God loves us as though we were perfect. And it's because He loves us that inclusively and that holistically that He invites us to see ourselves in the context of His grace. So I would say to a person who wants to respond by saying, look, it's not that homosexuality is part of me, that's all of me. I'd want to say, well, you may be experiencing life that way, but God doesn't see you that way. And God knows that He has a perfect plan for your life, a plan to prosper you, not harm you, give you hope in a future, whatever circumstances and struggles are in your life. And that's true for you. It's also true for me. And that's true for all of us. That's the grace of God. Thank you for watching Biblical Insights with Dr. Jim Dennison of the Dennison Forum. Follow us by clicking below for more answers to today's toughest questions.